What is going on, gum fighters? Saddle up for another episode of Gum Fighter Life. Saddle up to the bar and bring your bowl of Cheerios. Some of you will know what I'm talking about. We'll get to that in the main topic. Today we're going to talk about the PCC, the Pistol Caliber Carbine. The good, the bad, and the mostly useless. That's right, I'm going to pee in your Cheerios a little bit. Before we get to that, a little bit of housekeeping. You may notice a difference in audio quality. I am mobile. I might explain that at the end for those that care. But uh, this is a mobile episode, a throwback from those of you that listened way back when I was uh, commander of a tactical team to stop active shooters and I would record a lot mobily. Anyway, it's a mobile episode, so... As far as the bio, by the grace of God, I am what I am. God has blessed me to be a professional gunfighter most of my adult life. Military, combat veteran, Marine Corps, urban warfare instructor. Worked for a three-letter government agency I won't specify. I've been a private contractor. Also worked in law enforcement, LAPD. Worked some regular assignments, some more specialized assignments. State rifle and pistol champion a few times over, professional big game hunter and guide and lifelong hunter all over this beautiful country, and not because I'm bigger and badder than anybody else, and certainly not because I'm any better than the men that didn't make it home alive, but because God chose, for whatever reason, in his own sovereignty to have mercy on me because he had a purpose for me. Hopefully, I can use the time that I've been given to pass the knowledge and wisdom on to you blessings are meant to be shared. So with that today, we're going to talk about the pistol caliber carbine on this episode of Gunfighter Life. Blessed be the Lord, my rock, who trains my hands for war and fingers for battle. Okay, so the pistol caliber carbine or the pistol caliber rifle. Well, I guess it could be either. And there's really no hard and fast rule as far as what a rifle and a carbine is. It used to mean something like when you would have a military designation and you would have like a full length rifle and you would have a shorter version like a carbine. If you think of like the Mosin Agant M39, you might have the or the 9130 rather. And you might have the M44 carbine, like a shortened version of the Mosin Agant. Or you may have had a full-length infantry rifle, and you may have had a shorter cavalry carbine. A full-length rifle today is pretty rare. Like, if you look at the M16, the M16, like A4 that the Marine Corps has, is is a rifle. The M4 carbine is a carbine. It's a shorter version of that. That said, the M16, A1, A2, A4, not the M4, all of those are probably much smaller and lighter than the M44 carbine from days of yore. So it's kind of a flexible definition of what is a carbine and what is not a carbine, but they're generally referred to as a pistol caliber carbine. I'm going to break the pistol caliber carbine so into three different categories. And some of those I find really useful, some not so much. So I'll you save your Cheerios for the end. On that, since I have a long, long drive, I am literally driving from Idaho. I'm right now in Montana driving east, uh, back to the east coast. So I got a long drive. So you ever guys have you guys ever have ideas for businesses? Here's an idea talking about cereal. Talking about something to do in like an up and coming yuppie young urban professional neighborhood is a 90s themed cereal bar with all the cool 90s cereal. I think that was like the heyday. Country music, I think, was at its best in the 90s. And I think that cereal really hit its stride in the 90s. Your Cocoa Puffs, your Kicks, your Honey Bunches of Oats, Golden Grams, Cinnamon Toast Crunch. I don't know if those all came out in the 90s, but certainly they were all around. 
in that time period, I believe. How cool would it be to have like a yuppie bar, but a cereal bar where you go and maybe you get some high-end coffee and, and stuff like that, but you get all the 90s cereal. The low overhead, people would love it. Play 90s music and you get your favorite bowl of cereal. You could have other stuff too, but talk about something that you could charge money for and has a super low overhead, a cereal bar. Anyway, feel free to do that. That's not really my passion. I have no desire to live in a young, herby, young <laughs> urban professional neighborhood and run a cereal bar. So if you want to take that and run with it, go ahead. I think I'm much better qualified to talk about guns. <laughs> so let's talk about guns. The pistol caliber carbine. The first one I'm going to talk about, the good. And I'm going to call this the old school PCC, mostly the lever action. There have been a few pump action, but mostly lever action, manual transmission, manually operated pistol caliber carbines in what I will call traditional revolver cartridges. The most common are going to be your 357 and your 44 Magnum. No doubt there have been other calibers. There have been 45 Long Colt is, is not uncommon. There's also been like the 32s, but you get what I'm talking about a revolver cartridge, lever action, or maybe something else, but most commonly lever action. And I think these are good. These are good handy brush carbines. I think they're good for that. If you hunt in a place where you're just not going to get a shot over 50 yards, over 100 yards would be a stretch, and usually under 50 yards. These are great, fast handling little carbines. Also, they're a decent defensive round out of out of uh, a carbine. You know, you get an appreciable gain because you get a lot more powder burn out of a 357 and a carbine than you do a rifle. And likewise, a 44 Magnum. 44 Magnum is no slouch out of a handgun. 44 Magnum is maybe not a sledgehammer if you think of a sledgehammer. Well, it depends on the scale, right? If you consider the 4570 a freight train, then the 44 Mag out of a carbine is a sledgehammer. If you consider the 45, 70, a 12 pound sledge than maybe the 44 mags an 8 pound sledgehammer. But it's it's a powerhouse coming out of a carbine. You get a lot more powder burn, especially if you're talking about loading your own or, or making your own, you know, let's say 300, 310, 320 grain hard cast lead semi wad cutter, something on the slower burn rate end of the powder spectrum to give you that maximum velocity out of a carbine. It's, it's a good load. Right with a hard cast lead bullet, there's really no shot angle that I wouldn't take on a white-tailed deer. Again, it's a powerhouse, and if you talk about, I mean, even out to 125 yards, but certainly inside of that, it's a good option. If you talk about a really good crossover for defense for stuff like that, the 357 Magnum, and I'm not saying it's the best defensive carbine. I, I'm absolutely not, but some places. You can't have, a, well, let's say something that's within the past 120 years of technology. I mean, semi-autos were common in the turn of the, the 1900s. But some places have said you can't have early 1900s technology. you got to have manually operated carbines. So if you got to have something that you load every round yourself, a lever action 357 that you could use for hunting and or defense is not a bad option. So I would say that they're a good option for that. And those are great. Again, I think the best crossover caliber for, for that is 357 Magnum because it's, it's plenty powerful enough for defense out of a handgun. It's got some of the best street cred of any police round in history, maybe round per round. I mean, it doesn't win on capacity because it's usually in a revolver. But round per round, you know, it's a, it's a Walter Waite champion in the... Uh, you know the effectiveness of a handgun round and it only gets more so if you are smart about your bullet choices right i wouldn't want the same bullet construction out of a carbine as i would out of a handgun so i don't think you're just going to be able to use the same ammo it'll fire but you know there's kind of this goldilocks zone between expansion and penetration and they're inversely related right every time you increase the diameter of a bullet meaning it expands you decrease its ability to penetrate you got to balance that and a bullet that will expand pretty well out of a handgun may expand too rapidly and not penetrate deep enough even though it has more power out of a carbine. 
So I'm not telling you to use the same exact load, same bullets, but it's the same caliber. So if you wanted to do that, you could. And it's a it's it's a really good sweet spot, the 357 Magnum. It's powerful out of a handgun, and it's even more so out of a carbine. And the 44 Magnum, not so much, but it's probably a better hunting caliber, right? There, there's no doubt that a 44 Mag is is more powerful out of a carbine than a 357 Magnum. Whether you need that or not is up to you. If you're only going to be hunting deer, I'd say the difference is negligible. A good shot with either one. Some people just like more power. Also, if you're stepping up to bigger game, again, with a with the right bullet selection, not your common hollow point round or whatever, but a good like hard cast semi wad cutter out of a 44 mag out of a carbine, I'd have no problem with that on elk or something bigger, big bear at reasonable ranges. So I think they're pretty useful. They're also classic, and I'm not saying this is right, but I'm saying that it is. Often people who are maybe not anti-gun, but they've been led down a certain path to believe that certain colors of guns or certain styles of guns are scarier than others, that is not going to get the same kind of knee-jerk visceral reaction, in my opinion, with a walnut and blued steel cowboy-looking lever-action carbine as an AK-47 or an AR-15. And you could say that's ridiculous, and I'm not saying that it's logical, I'm saying that it is. And you that might raise a lot less eyebrows in certain situations, which could be a good thing, right? If if they're going to take it, if it's a black rifle, and by they may, I mean some warlord or some, some uh, government entity that's confiscating certain kinds of guns or banning certain kinds of guns or whatever, you know, they're less likely to ban. I don't think a lot of people are trampling to ban lever actions. I mean, I'm sure they'd love to eventually, but they're going to start with the black rifles and those kind of things. So they're less likely to get banned. Like even in California where you can't rock, you know, an AK-47 in the back of your truck, you could probably rock a lever action carbine, assuming um, it's legal to carry one loaded or unloaded or whatever. You get the idea. It's more permissible, and I'm not saying that's right or wrong. I'm saying that it is. Whether that's actual legality or social acceptability. And some people care a lot about what other people think. Me, not so much, but I've come to realize that many people care what other people think. So there is that. And that's the lever action kind of, let's call it the lever action cowboy carbine for pistol caliber carbines. Obviously, there are other calibers. We're talking today about PCCs. So that's a, that's a good thing there. They're not bad. The other one that we have is what I'm going to call a PDW. And there's all kinds of PDWs, right? You get, and that's a, again, that's kind of a flexible Gumby term. It can bend and shape however you want it to. You could call a short barreled AR a PCC. And I would say, yes, absolutely. And you could call, you know, uh, obviously the PS90 and the H&K MP7. Of course, those are PDWs. They were designed for that. Also kind of the M1 carbine, kind of the OG, uh, PDW, personal defense weapon, but kind of a short, handy, compact weapon. And I think those have a lot of merit. Uh, I didn't mention in the bio, and I don't often mention it, but I have done quite a bit of EP work, uh, executive protection, and uh, anywhere from like the highest of the high end A list celebrities to the like going up into dignitaries and secret service type stuff. I have done that kind of work, doing stuff like vehicle convoys and things like that, or even for you, like if you work in a cubicle and you can carry a laptop bag or have that in your vehicle again where it doesn't raise eyebrows or you take public transportation right something that fits handy in a laptop bag that's what i'm talking about when i talk about a pdw and there is a certain kind of thing that you could call a quasi pdw a quasi pistol caliber carbine so it's a personal defense weapon but also a pistol caliber but not actually what we would think of as a traditional pistol and you might think of this as like your roni braces or some other kind of pistol braced brace pistol that is much bigger than an actual pistol like you're probably not carrying an appendix right you're probably not carrying it in a holster on your hip you're probably carrying it in a bag or something like that it's quite a bit bigger than a traditional handgun but still quite a bit smaller than an ar-15 or something like that. And that would be your PDW PCC. And I think these have quite a bit of merit. Uh, you could argue whether the 5.7 is a 
is a handgun round or a rifle round. The fact of it, the matter is that it's both. It's a PDW round. So these M57 would be great, but more traditionally, and to keep in the spirit of today's episode, the more traditional pistol calibers, and the de facto one is 9mm. But something like the 320 kits or the Glock kits that are those kind of short, handy, foldable, compact pistol caliber carbines. I think those are fantastic. I think they have a lot of merit. I think they are really good for the urbanite, for the, again, for EP work, if you're in that kind of work, where you maybe can't have a full-size gun or it would hinder you to move out and about in and out of vehicle convoys. But it still gives you quite a bit more capability than a traditional handgun. You know, you get, it's just, it's just easier to control. And it doesn't have the bulk and weight of a full-size weapon. And that kind of environment, or where you, perhaps you could have something bigger than a handgun, but you could not have a full-size rifle. Like the aforementioned, you got a laptop bag, maybe you even have a laptop in it. But you also have your Roni kit 320 or... There's a bunch of other like Flux, the Flux Raider, I think, is another big one. You have that kind of braced pistol in your laptop bag, and you're good, you got more firepower than you normally would in a handgun, but it's something you can still have, whereas you're just not going to have an AR, right? You're probably not carrying your guitar case with your Tommy gun, right? Or your, or your probably something more reasonable, like, you know, an M4, even with a folding stock. It's much too big to get away with in many of those environments. So those kind of PCCs, I see a lot of merit there. Now, legally in the U.S., if you put a brace on it, it would be a pistol, but not in the pistol in a traditional sense. It would be a pistol caliber carbine for practical purposes, even if it's legally a pistol, or you would actually get it registered as a short-barreled rifle, even though we all know it's basically a PCC. Uh, so those kind of PCCs, what, however legally you want to do that, whether you want to go through the the rigmarole of getting the tax stamp and paying the $200, or you want to just go the pistol brace route, which is still going to give you quite a bit more firepower than a traditional pistol, but not be a legal short-barreled, short-barreled rifle, which if you're talking about vehicle convoys has a lot of merit, because if you don't know, even after you pay your tax stamp, even after you wait the waiting period, even after you do all the paperwork and get your short-barreled rifle, you're still supposed to notify ATF when you cross state lines which, I mean, I'm on a road trip right now. Every time I cross a state line, so I'm driving from Idaho, and right now I'm in Montana, and I'm going to cross, I don't know how many states before I get to the East Coast, but am I supposed to write a letter and mail it from whatever mailbox every time I cross a state line to the ATF? That seems pretty unreasonable to me. So in that case, even though it might be a registered short-barreled rifle, you know, if you get in a shooting with that in a different state, You know, did you really notify them every time you cross state lines? Maybe not a thing for you if you are in the Dallas-Fort Worth Metroplex and you almost never leave Texas. But for people that cross state lines a lot, on often in EP work, that is a big deal. A lot of EP work involves flying. And if you're flying, you're obviously probably crossing state lines. And with that, even if you check your bag and do all the right things, or if it's a private enterprise private jet, private charter, whatever. Again, when you cross state lines, if it's a registered short barrel rifle, that gives you issues. But the pistol caliber carbine and a braced pistol, I think there's a lot of merit there for times, again, when you can't really have something bigger, even if it's legal, it's just not practical. And it still gives you more firepower than a traditional handgun. Even if you, I still would want a traditional handgun on me, but it makes a good bag carry gun, a laptop bag gun, a duffel bag gun. You get the idea. Uh, a suitcase gun for, again, travel, hotel rooms, things like that. It's a good option. And for those, I think they have a lot of merit because you're they're increasing your firepower over a traditional handgun. So those are both good categories of PCCs. Uh, let's talk about the bad and the mostly useless. And I think, sadly, these are some of the most common PCCs. And, again, get your bowl of Cheerios because I'm about to pee in them. But I might pee in your Cheerios, but I've said before, at least I'm not going to pee on you and tell you that it's raining. I'm straight up going to tell you. And 
First, I'm going to tell you why they don't make a lot of sense for a lot of people. Number one is many of them are as big and weigh as much as a rifle, as a, as a regular carbine, right? If you look at the weight of a lot of these carbines, like the Ruger PC carbine, and I'm sure that's a fully functional, decent, as far as working PCC carbine goes, but if you look at the weight of that, or even a high point carbine or something like it, I can pretty easily get an AR that's similar in weight and size. That's a intermediate cartridge rifle round. Or what I prefer in most situations, if you're talking like a truck gun or something, a shotgun, which is way more flexible. If I'm carrying something the size of a traditional long gun, I want something with the power of a traditional long gun, right? An AK-47, an M4, a shotgun. These are all totally different ballparks than a 9mm PCC out of a 16-inch barrel. Do you gain velocity in a 9mm out of a 16-inch barrel? Sure, but you don't get to anywhere near 16 16 inch ballistics with a 223 or 762 by 39 or many other calibers. You just don't. You could cherry pick and maybe find me some load somewhere, somehow. And if you get crazy short in your AR barrels, you do get really inefficient and a lot of unburnt powder, but you got to go to the extreme. And again, if, if I'm running something the size of a long gun, I want power. I want greater lethality. I want greater effectiveness. I want greater point blank range or I want greater flexibility and power as in the case of the shotgun. So mostly useless. Uh, I'm just going to, again, and I know they're super popular and here's a couple of reasons they're super popular. I think a lot of people, and you don't have to agree with me. I just did a whole podcast on that. A lot of people I'm talking about from a practical standpoint for gunfighting. This is gunfighter life. A lot of people just get guns to spend money. They just want a cool, fun gun to spend a bunch of money on. If you look at what you're going to spend on a PCC, even a cheap one, like a high point carbine, you could probably get a much more capable, much more flexible pump action shotgun, reasonable rate of fire, something like a Maverick 88 or, or something like it. That's going to be way more effective. Look at look at 12 gauge slug ballistics compared to a PCC at most defensive ranges. Talking inside 150 yards, it's not even not even the same ballpark, not even the same sport, not even the same city. It's totally different. If you talk about a more expensive PCC, you can get crazy expensive in a PCC, especially you're like, I'm going to get one of the AR quasi AR PCCs, and I'm going to put a suppressor on it so that I can shoot it indoors and I'm going to pay the $200 tax stamp plus all the money on the suppressor plus the price of the carbine plus all this stuff. Okay. How much money did you spend on that? And what kind of AR or or other fighting actual intermediate caliber carbine could you actually get for that money? And if you say, well, but it's quiet. Okay. Problem number one first, stop the threat. Stop the threat. You want to stop the threat, more power. More power to me is of much, much more important than a suppressor on my gun, even for home defense. I don't care. As you might imagine from my bio, I have fired quite a few rounds without hearing protection. And I'm not telling you to do that. I'm not saying that I should have done that. I'm saying that if my life depends on it, I will. And I have done that several times. And every time I get a hearing test, I have perfect hearing. And I am, uh, well, let's just say middle age at this point easily. If you count middle age as like the actual lifespan, the average lifespan. Now, if I live to be 120, I'm like third age. But if we assume the average lifespan of a man here in America in uh, the 20th century, 21st century, uh, let's say middle age, right? And I have perfect hearing. Again, I'm not telling you it's a good idea. And obviously, if you can wear hearing protection, wear hearing protection. I even like to wear hearing protection when I go hunting, which most people don't. But what I'm saying is if somebody's trying to kill me, 
and have to shoot a round or two without hearing protection, I'll take that over a much less effective, quieter round that I have to shoot several times that may or may not stop the threat and he may or may not get away or he may or may not be able to keep fighting. You get the idea. For me, problem number one first, stop the threat. There is no comparison between handgun ballistics and rifle or shotgun ballistics. They are much, much less effective. If you doubt that, look at the empirical data. Not what you want to be true, not what you feel to be true, not because somebody that got a PCC handed to them and was endorsed by some company to give a good review says, look at empirical data. Look at something like Greg Ellifritz, uh, handgun stopping power, and look at that compared to rifles and shotguns. Right? Look at actual data. Handgun rounds, even handguns fired out of longer barrels, handgun rounds, are no comparison as compared to intermediate cartridges or shotgun rounds, especially not shotgun rounds. But even, even the most mundane of intermediate cartridges like the 5.56 is still way more effective than 9mm. So I think a lot of people, again, they buy a gun because they want to take it to the range and shoot it, and they think, oh, I hit a piece of steel out of range, and therefore it's just as good as this AR because I can hit the steel plate with both of them or I can hit the target with both of them. But you're not talking about shooting a steel plate. You're not talking about shooting a piece of cardboard. You're talking about stopping the most dangerous flesh and blood creature on the planet that is trying to kill you, that being man. Man is the most dangerous, dangerous creature as far as flesh and blood on this planet. Presumably a well-armed man trying to kill you. You're not shooting cardboard. You're not shooting steel. The fact that you can go plink, 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 plink on steel plates on a range with a PCC is super fun. I get it. And if we're talking about a fun gun, PCCs are some of the most fun guns. But don't kid yourself into thinking because they're fun at the range, they're anywhere near as effective as a actual carbine or as a shotgun. They're not, right? Nobody... Nobody is, no army in the world is taking away the assault rifle or the intermediate cartridge or the carbine and issuing PCCs, especially not semi-auto PCCs with a 16-inch barrel, right? There might be specialized units that run PDWs, and there are certainly PCCs that we would run in more specialized assignments. I had access to all kinds of special weapons, and PCCs in full auto can certainly be can certainly be uh, effective but that's probably off the table for you you know the fact that you the fact that specialized units run MP5s suppressed that are full auto that's a different ball game you're not talking about the effectiveness of a round you're talking about the effectiveness of 10 rounds probably in a very short amount of time in a close distance. You're probably not doing that. And even when I had access to all kinds of those kind of specialized weapons, I almost always went for went for a actual like carbine, like a intermediate caliber carbine or a shotgun. Will they are I should say this. Are they more effective than a handgun for most people in that kind of situation, like a home defense situation or something? Yeah, they're more effective than a handgun. But again, they're the size and weight of a lot of much more effective options. So again, the mostly useless. If I'm grabbing something with a 16-inch barrel, because it has to legally have a 16-inch barrel, why wouldn't I grab an M4? Why wouldn't I grab, you know, something else? Why wouldn't I grab a shotgun with buckshot and slugs? Why? Why would I grab something like that? I, I'm not there for fun, right? This is not a fun thing. This, if we're talking about fun, yeah, they're super fun. I'm talking about this is gunfighter life. I'm talking about you're playing 4D chess for keeps. And I'm talking about what's fun. I'm not talking about you wanting to spend a bunch of money on a Gucci fun gun that shoots 9mm super quiet at the range with a suppressor. I'm talking about actual effectiveness. Round per round, shot per shot, platform for platform. And to me, the 16-inch AR style or similar PCC is mostly useless. 
Sorry to pee in your Cheerios. I will put a couple of caveats in there. They are low pressure. They are sometimes easy to fold. If you can get a foldable one, that goes back to what we talked about before. That would be more in the category of the laptop bag gun or the small bag gun because a folding PCC is probably better than just a pistol for sure if we're comparing it to a pistol. If we're talking about that kind like a a folding PCC because although you can get folding ARs, they're much more complicated. You're dealing with much higher pressures. There are not a lot of them out there and there's not as many good options. Sometimes you can get like a folding stock. They're okay and not my favorite. You can't fire it while they're folded. Many of the PCCs, you can fire it while folded. So I would put that more into the PDW kind of category because it can be so small. But I'm talking a non-folding 16-inch barrel carbine that weighs as much as an M4, as much as a pump-action shotgun. I just... It's a fun gun. It's a... It's... But... If you're, for some reason, considering that for actual defensive use, I would perhaps reconsider. There's another thing people throw out there, and I'm not saying it's completely invalid, but again, problem number one first, stop the threat. And that is interchangeability of magazines and ammunition. I get that. I get that that is an advantage. But to me, I would never take that trade-off over a more effective round-per-round gun. Okay, so I have a big, heavy long gun that takes the same ammo as my pistol, but I'd rather have a more effective long gun, right? The odds of me needing that long gun to be effective and to stop a threat quickly is much more important to me than the fact that in some weird scenario, I could take a magazine out of that and put it in my pistol. Is that a real thing? It is a real thing, but on the scale of what's important to me, stopping a threat quickly with a proper round is important to me. Much more important to me than ammo swappability, for lack of a better term. Going back to, you know, the 44 caliber, just going off on a tangent to illustrate it, we talked about the 44 lever action carbine. That's a great, great hunting carbine. But I would not generally carry unless I was in bear country or something I'm talking about normal day-to-day stuff the way that most people live in a people hive in a suburb I would probably not carry a 44 revolver as a as a like concealed carry handgun for a lot of reasons just because that interchangeability with my truck gun I would rather have a more effective actual CCW handgun that didn't interchange with my carbine I think a 44 lever action carbine in some types of layouts in some areas of the country would be a good choice for a truck gun. But I wouldn't start carrying a 44 Magnum uh, CCW, again, unless I was carrying it because it was a good choice. If I could carry, you know, a full-size fighting handgun with magazines and a 9mm, I would do that. And I wouldn't go to a uh, 5 or 6 shot 44 Magnum because it had the same kind of ammo as my 44. So is it a real advantage? It is a real advantage, but I think much, much less important than having the right caliber for the right job. And again, if I'm carrying a gun that big and heavy, I would much rather have the much more effective, longer point blank range or much more flexibility and certainly much more power in almost any other circumstance. With a much, and nothing is certain in ballistics. There's always a gray area in ballistics. Bullets do funny things. I've been a professional gunfighter most of my adult life, a professional big game hunter and guide. I've slain more animals than I could honestly remember or put a number on if I really tried hard. And sometimes bullets do weird things. So there's nothing certain, but your odds of stopping a deadly threat with one or two shots of five, five, six, and that's kind of on the low end is way higher. Look at the lethality of handgun rounds. Not that lethality is what you want, but it's a it's a decent metric to compare the power. The vast majority of handgun rounds are not lethal. And therefore, if you're up against a determined attacker, right, you could pull out your gun and they could give up, which would be great for everybody. But if they're determined, if they're determined to do everything they can up until the point that they expire to kill you, 
you want an effective round for that. And the fact that the vast majority of handgun rounds, and I don't care if you're a caliber warrior, I don't care if you're talking 9 millimeter or 45, they're much less effective than rifle and shotgun rounds. I would much rather have an effective round that was much, much more likely to stop the threat on the first, second, third round. That's way more important to me than the fact that it'll take the same Glock mags as a Glock. Right? That's, that is, again, it's an advantage, but way less important to me than actually stopping the threat on the first or second round. Anyway, those are my thoughts on the PCC. I know this will probably not be a popular opinion. I'm okay with that. With Oh, and I, I said that I would mention, and I got plenty of road ahead, <laughs> over 2,000 miles. So I am driving cross-country. My wife, maybe you guys don't care, but maybe some of you do. Maybe some of you listen day to day. I know the patrons probably do. They step up and support the show. But for those of you that just care about me and what I'm doing and, and where I'm at, I'm traveling across country. I generally don't like going east of the Mississippi River. Just way too peopley back there. Just a people hive. Just a population density. Just does not add up for me. I don't like that math. But I am going east of the Mississippi because my wife's friend uh, sadly lost a child, which is a horrible thing. And she herself ended up in the hospital really, really injured, uh, really I don't know if injury, I guess injured, sick, really in rough shape. And we, my wife, as soon as she heard it, basically decided to fly back and help out. Uh, She's got a couple of other kids she needs help with while she's in the hospital. We thought maybe she'd be in the hospital. We were hoping for a couple of days. I don't know why I thought that. Just, I just hoped, I guess. But she's been in the hospital for far longer. My wife's been away for quite a long time helping to take care of her family. And we've been apart for a long time. And I love my wife. I love her so much that I am driving across the country to spend some time with her because I don't know how long she's going to be there helping to take care of that. So I am road tripping it across the country. I am somewhere in the wilds of Montana, somewhere between Lolo and Butte. Yeah, I know it's beautiful country because I've driven across the country I don't know how many times, but it's pretty dark and 24 degrees out. But that's where I am headed. Uh, With that, if you want to support the show, I'll be honest with you, I could use the help. I would really hope that you consider becoming a patron. There's a Patreon link in the show notes. So if if you've been thinking about becoming a patron, if you're a regular listener, I would appreciate you becoming a patron. It it means more to me than just the money, but, right, gunpowder costs money. Gasoline costs money. If you want to support, I would appreciate it. Patrons get a lot of cool insider-only content. A lot of insider-only shows. Gems such as Guns for Bigfoot and Guns for the Zombie Apocalypse. Try to do fun stuff like that just for the patrons. We also have our own little insider chat where we talk about hopefully important stuff like theology and Bible verses and, and really important stuff like that. We also chat guns all the time. So if you ever thought, oh, I wonder what Melito thinks about... X, Y, Z. Well, the guys in the chat just basically asked me, hey, one came up yesterday. I'm really trying to decide between, you know, the SIG 320 X5 Legion and the Beretta, you know, M9A4. And that was a real chat that we had in the discussion trying to help this guy and ask, like, germane questions. Like, what about this? What about that? Are you going to carry it? Is it is it a combat handgun? Is it a concealed carry handgun? Are you going to shoot competition with it? Right, because those were guns designed for different things. The X5 Legion 320, the tungsten one, that was designed for competition. That was designed to be good in a certain division of USPSA and to be a smooth shooting striker fired gun. Um, the other one was designed to be a really good combat fighting handgun. So, what's your use of, what's your philosophy? What, are, what conditions are you going to use it in? What's it primarily for? Anyway, just little things like that, that little in the grand scheme of things, but probably pretty important for that guy and hopefully we steered him in the right direction there and it's not just me it's iron sharpening iron there's all kinds of good useful information because there's guys in there that know way more about me than all kinds of subjects comms and driving and engines and towing and all kinds of useful stuff one of those guys helped me really helped me out the other day 
um, with the vehicle issue I had never experienced before. And I just popped into the chat and somebody in there just helped me out. And it was just one of the small things on Patreon. Anyway, I guess that'll be enough on Patreon if you want to support that way. Also, if you just want to, you don't want to become a patron, but you want to just real quickly support the show, there's a Venmo link. Some guy asked me, uh, who actually became a patron, but he asked me, he said, hey, I want to just send you some money. I said, okay, I guess so. Uh, he said, do you have a Venmo? I don't think I did at the time, but I set one up. So there's a there's usually a Venmo link in the show notes. If you just want to just send a couple of bucks and say, hey, I appreciate the show. I appreciate what you're doing. Uh, you know, I want to help out. There, but I don't want to do like a monthly thing and I don't want to be a patron. Then there's a Venmo link in there too if you want to give that away. Anyway, enough about that. The tactical tip of the day. I did a Patreon-only episode today, but if you're not a patron, you probably won't hear that. If you are a patron, forgive the redundancy, but I think it's a good tip. Uh, today up in uh, the Red Out, before I left you know, northern Idaho, that real high up plateau area where I have been residing, uh, one of my favorite, probably my favorite place in the entire country for, for a lot of reasons, but uh, there's millions of acres of public land and, and remote area if you got a four-wheel drive and... I don't generally go to a regular range or generally make my own. But today I figured since I was going on a road trip, it would be germane to practice. I usually dry fire um, every day except for Sabbath and try and get some range training in. Well, I wanted to, one, confirm the dope, the zero on my truck gun, which is a Mossberg 590. Uh, Not my only truck gun, but the one that's close at hand as a long gun. So I wanted to confirm the the dope on that since I recently changed optics and I just wanted to make sure it was all good before the road trip. So, you know, launched some slugs down range and confirm it was good to go. And then I also practiced in dry fire different vehicle tactics, right? Uh, Using the A pillar, B pillar, maneuvering around the vehicle, using it for cover, using it as concealment. All those kind of stuff, which is pretty germane to, you know, pretty much daily life because most people drive to and from places during the day. So it's probably pretty germane. If you live east of the Mississippi where you usually have to go to a range, if you do and you just happen to be the only one there and it's permitted and it's allowed and you can drive like up to the bay, try practicing that in a safe manner, whether it's dry fire or live fire. Right, try practicing your vehicle tactics. That is pretty important. You know, remember your A pillar, B pillar, your engine block, your your vehicle wheels generally are pretty good cover for most things, but practice different areas on the vehicle, practice getting out of the vehicle with your gun, practice um, again dry fire in a safe manner, but you know maneuvering and working a handgun inside the vehicle. Those are all good germane skills if you can do it. Like if you just happen to be the only one at the range and you're still pointing your gun in a safe direction and all that stuff and you can pull right up to a bay. If you're at the kind of range that has like several different bays and you've got the whole one to yourself and, you know, you're not going to hurt anything and you're not breaking any rules if you have to shoot somewhere where there's rules. Uh, consider doing that. Don't don't forget about that. Gunfights don't generally happen off a bench. So get your actual good skills germane to your general day-to-day life in there and I think part of that is vehicle skills and tactics so if you get an opportunity to do that I hope that you will remember to do that with that your tactical verse of the day since I am driving I will go from memory and I will quote Psalm 23 the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters He restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Thanks for listening.